Hey guys, we got a special interview today. I've got Matthew Park in this morning. Um, he is running for House District 15 in Knoxville. Um, we've got a whole lineup of interviews today. We're going to have a good time. We're going to squeeze out as much information we can before this August 6th deadline. Um, i got uh, three more on later today. And, well, we'll start with Matt and, or Matthew, excuse me, and we'll go from there. So, Matthew, welcome to the show. Absolutely. Appreciate Thanks you for coming in. Me. Let's start off with... Um, the biography version of things, the, the the quick history of Matthew and, you know, like where you are you from Knoxville, that kind of thing, and then what got you into the politics side of getting active in politics in Knoxville? Yeah, so I grew up in rural East Tennessee and uh, moved uh, to Knoxville like a lot of people do to go to UT. Uh, the big thing that got me, uh, so I worked as an EMT uh, in Knoxville uh, for a while, and one of the big things that got me into politics uh, my little brother was a victim of the school to prison pipeline, arrested in high school uh, because of a zero tolerance policy. Um, so I saw that over 14 years or so, what that ends up doing to a family and to a person to uh, have that uh, pipeline um, straight from the schools into the prisons. Um, so that's what really got me involved in the uh, national prison abolition movement uh, and looking at, you know, transforming justice here in Tennessee, uh, really the state levels where we have to do that. Uh, so that's one of the big drivers for me running for state house. Okay. That's, uh, um, we've had some conversations on the big show about the prison system and some of the issues that we feel like are there. Um, so I guess the first thing is, um, just to kind of run the thread down a little bit. Um, as I told you before we started, we're complete amateurs and we're proud of that. Honestly. Um, I'm hoping for part of our listenership in me being educated on how the process works is going to help people be more informed in their decision making, not just about the individual, but about how these things actually work. Um, and so one of the big things I always ask um, in other House and Senate races in the state of Tennessee that I've talked to is on the day to day, you know, obviously one of the ones that everybody's talking about, it's going to be budget, 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 budget day one, because we have such a mess right now because of the virus and stuff going on. But how much... Um, uh, like, like, what is the day to day look like for a representative for Tennessee? As far as you know, what are some of the bills that you either want to get in there, or you know that are on the on the pipeline that you want to be a part of? Those kind of things. Um, and again, obviously, on on your prison system part of the conversation, um, how much is already in place, and how much do you think you can get in there and adjust? Absolutely. So I think uh, the the day to day really looks like you would imagine it would. Uh, there are sessions where you're filing bills and voting on bills, committee meetings, uh, but there's also a lot you're doing for your constituents. So people call into the office and say, hey, I haven't gotten my unemployment check. I haven't um, been able to get in contact with my relative that is in a, in a Tennessee Department of Corrections facility. So there's a lot of helping constituents sort of grease the wheels of government, as it were, right? Okay. Uh, that's a big part of what legislators do all year long, because Tennessee does have a part-time legislature, uh, meaning the session normally runs from January to May or so, uh, whenever it's adjourned. So it's really only uh, a couple quarters at the beginning of the year, unless there's a special session. Uh, as far as bills that I, I hope to get passed, there's really three big pieces uh, to what I want to push. We, as house members, we only get 15 bills a year. Uh, see, these are, these are the things like, well, like, uh, not to distract from time, but it means like, what is the point of that rule? Like yeah. those kind of things are the things I want to know more about. This might not be the best time to explore those conversations because we're on a clock with the election coming up, but those are the things that interest me as much as anything else, but continue where you were. I apologize for interrupting. Yeah. So, uh, I think I think a person to give a little history on that's not me on why the 15 <laughs> bills are there, uh, but I think you can probably project why why it is right. the The House side, the lower house of any legislature, is tends to be the the wilder house, right? Uh, it tends to be the the place that is more representative of of the people, and therefore the place that um, that more things are brought up, more things are voted on, more things are talked about. Uh, if you look at the U.S. Congress, the House has a lot more rules than the Senate, right. um, because the Senate is it uh, is the upper house. It's uh, historically supposed to be the the one that has um, longer debates um, and that sort of thing. Uh, so that is that is 
one of the reasons that the 15 bill uh, limit is there. I'm sure there's a lot more exciting history. Uh, I had a conversation uh, about it with uh, Victor Ash, yeah. uh, who was, I think, one of the youngest people ever elected to the uh, state house. I that think. does bring up that question. How old are you? Uh, 30, but I'm turning 31 on election day. On election on day, nice. 6th. Okay. Yeah. Again, um, that's one of the things I like. Um, um, I like to see more of, um, <clears throat> and it's weird of me getting older, which I'm not that much older, but having people running for office that are younger than me, like a, that was something, you know, as I started to get into politics when I was younger, it's like they're all old people. It's always old people. And then now they're still mostly old people, but there's a good influx of people that are younger than me. And I like that. I think it's a good thing. But anyway, um, yeah, continue with, with, uh, with your... Yeah, so uh, Victor Ash did a lot. Uh, I think he was elected when he was like 23 or something like that. Uh, and uh, there was... Somebody's going to have to go look this up. But there was some situation where his mom had to hold the seat for a couple of years until he was old enough to actually hold it. But uh, he and I had a discussion about the 15 bill limit, and, and he didn't really agree with it because uh, I don't think it was there during his tenure in the House. Um, but back to the main point, we only get 15 bills. So right. you have to say, what are the 15 items that I want to work on and push for and advocate for this year? So for me, I have three top ones. So uh, I've been really, really uh, specific about our policies and our platform. It's probably the most specific one that anyone running in the state has. Uh, because I see it as kind of a to-do list. Right. Uh, I, whenever someone asks me a question about where I stand on something, we update the website with that because if I've said it out loud uh, and and uh, it's out there, we think that we should let everyone know what I'm thinking. Um, so the top three things for me are justice transformation. Okay. Uh, inside that, there's a lot of pieces because right. 15 bills, but they can be long. Right, right. right. Uh, so inside that, there's ending cash bail, uh, there's ending time-based punishments um, and, and a bunch of other things that we can get into. Uh, the second one is the black agenda because we have a 42% black poverty rate here in Knoxville. It's almost double what the white poverty rate is. Uh, so the second one is a black agenda to uh, do things from finance to housing to food. Um, and the third one is the Tennessee Green New Deal. Okay. Uh, because we are in a climate crisis uh, and we can do a lot at the state level. Um, so those are the three big policy packages that I plan to push. Okay. Um, and those are all quite interesting to me. Um, you know, I don't, um, I read a little bit about the green new deal through your, the Tennessee version of the green new deal. Um, and as far as I could tell, at least searching for it, you're the only one actually talking about it in a Tennessee level outside of AOC's national level mm -hmm. version of it. Um, and so on that one specifically, like what are like, is it a, like an incentives program to incentivize business is to get into it is a punishment program to get, you know, KB and TVA to start pushing green or else, or is it some combination thereof? Um, is it more business based or is it more citizen based as a plan? Uh, so it's definitely more citizen based as a plan. Okay. Uh, one of the big things that we wanted to do, because I'm aware that, that, uh, what the climate crisis manifestation is, is different, whether you're in rural Tennessee, whether you're in urban Tennessee, whether you're in Knoxville or Memphis or Nashville, Chattanooga, the Tri-Cities, right? So depending on where you are in our state, we have vastly different geographies. True. Um, so the manifestation of the climate crisis is different, and therefore our response is somewhat different. Okay. So one of the key things is that we wanted to create this, uh, the Tennessee Climate Justice Commission, uh, and pull in stakeholders from youth to business, uh, to government, to citizens, uh, labor, really people from all uh, walks of life and expertise, pull them together and say, okay, what is what are the tactical things that we can do across the state in very specific places? Uh, so we're not taking anything off the table. One of the key things I think for us is that uh, we do want to put renewable portfolio standards on TVA. Uh, okay. We do want to say, TVA, <clears throat> it's time for you to... Uh, to live up to your mission, right, and do the good that you can do. Uh, I had a conversation yesterday about TVA has been a, a, a harbinger of good for a long time, right? Uh, but they've they've kind of laxed on that, and they've forgotten how much power they have to do good. Right, because we're kind of like we're an interesting collection of peoples. Um, one of the main things that bring us together, we're, we all enjoy hunting. We go on a hunting trip every year, and so we're big TWRA fans. Um, our standard opening weekend hunting ground is a TVA um, watershed that we get to, that we go hunt on and we love that part of it. Um, and so one of the, I mean, 
you know, we are conservationists at, at the core because of what we enjoy doing as a result of that. And so I'm always interested to hear more about kind of that direction because I've, I've argued for a long time I don't understand. Um, I mean, I understand that there's influences pushing things in certain ways, but I don't understand why certain um, – um, the renewables aren't being pushed further. Cause I know like I looked into it here at the house. I was trying to see how much it cost me to go at least semi-solar to try to pull off some of my KUB bill. And it's a quarter of the cost of my house to get a system that should run my entire household. And, you know, you know, it'd be almost a quarter. If I had no KUB bill, that'd take a quarter of my mortgage off the table. But I mean, it's still painfully expensive. And like, I, years ago, I started looking into it because I was curious about it, and understandably, super expensive because it was brand new and mm-hmm. and it was high end, and we hadn't had any real field testing on a lot of these products. But nowadays, it still bothers me how expensive it is. Um, you know, as a business person myself, I kind of see it as either there, there, there's. I assume that there's something in the production that is still so prohibitively expensive that we haven't figured out how to get cheaper on. Um, but I think one of the things that will help that in the long run, which I guess is why KUB and TVA aren't big on it is when the big energy providers start getting into it, that's going to help bring costs down. But if that helps bring costs down, then they're going to be buying less from them. So I kind of get that on a on, on one of the reasons they may be dragging their feet. I'm talking completely out of my <laughs> ass, but um, that's what we do here. So um, again, that's one of those things. I, I, I like the idea of it, um, and I want to see some of the options on the table as far as when that goes. But going back to the beginning of that, when you say climate justice, I hear punishment. Um, uh, no, and, not- and maybe that's my misperception of, of how you use the term justice in general. But when I hear justice, I hear, you know, um, this infraction has occurred and this is the consequence for that infraction. Um, and you're saying no. So please uh, correct me. Yeah. So to loop that back into the justice transformation I was talking about, I think that's a, that's a really unfortunate side effect of things like mass incarceration and Um, Well, no, hold on. Because when you started on the Green New Deal part, you said, um, I can't remember the exact phrase you said, but it was it was it was climate justice organization or grouping. Yeah, the the uh, people, the the, the group of people that you wanted to bring together to help give real world. This is how this affects me kind of thing. So that's the one specifically I I was I was getting at. Yeah. So I was just uh, just saying real quick that that, uh, I think one of the big problems we have in our society is when we think about justice, we do think about punishment. Okay, okay, so, I'm sorry. So uh, when we're talking about the Tennessee Climate Justice Commission, uh, what I mean when I say climate justice or environmental justice or justice in general is is saying what, what does that look like uh, to an everyday person? Uh, and I'll give you a specific example. Uh, there was a study put out a couple of years ago that, and I think it's linked on our website, that... Uh, a, a lot of uh, black and brown communities breathe 50 percent more particulate matter than many white communities and that's uh, mostly related to proximity to um, different industrial parks and things like that right um, so when we're talking about climate justice we're talking about uh, one admitting that and then saying okay what do we need to do to provide justice to these families that uh, do have higher rates of prostate cancer and and asthma and um, other uh, other medical disorders because of their proximity to these different things. Okay. So, uh, and then the other thing I'm talking about when I'm talking, I'm talking about uh, especially if you go down to any of our KCDC uh, low income housing units during, we have a lot of stormwater problems there. Yeah. And uh, you'll see in the Tennessee Green New Deal, we talk about daylighting streams uh, to one, to handle the stormwater that is increasing. Uh, so when we're talking about climate justice, it is saying the climate is in crisis, but it's also creating injustices in communities. So climate justice is about uh, repairing those injustices that are created because of the climate crisis. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that makes it a little less punitive, I guess, in, in intent at least. Um, I, I'd love to go way down um, some of the, the, the racial aspects of what you're talking about, but that's a whole rabbit hole. Um, maybe we'll save that for after you uh, when you're um, your primary and we'll come back and talk about that some more. And so criminal justice reform being a big one, obviously that's a racial issue as well. Um, you know, uh, I've never been a pot smoker. I've never really enjoyed it. I've tried it. I've done my thing. Um, but I always argue generally as a libertarian. Um, so the war on drugs is a big problem with me, which is, I don't know what the percentage is. You could probably pull it off the top of your head, but how many people are incarcerated in the United States for 
a joint or two or some stupid ridiculous low amount of that and i mean again as a libertarian i'll argue for the legality of heroin and cocaine and everything else um that's that's my stance on it in general um but obviously i guess the point being is that um the war on drugs is is a huge chunk of our incarcerated population um so is it something that you is is that an avenue you see in attacking trying to help justice reform yeah absolutely so we spent we spent close to two trillion dollars uh and i don't know about you but i've got some serious buyer's remorse for uh for the war on drugs <laughs> well there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of buyer's remorse when, when when you're talking to me about government but uh, yeah. continue uh and what all we've all we've done uh in the war on drugs is fueled mass incarceration uh we have created this system uh one uh that that picks people up off the street um, for essentially a, a, you know, we use this term victimless crimes, uh, but, uh, but we're picking people up off the street for this. And then we're putting them into this system that, uh, that has profit built in. Uh, it is uh, full of fees and fines. Right. Uh, 70% of the Knox County jail at this moment, at any given time, really mm. is uh, people that have not been convicted of any crime. Uh, there are people that can't afford the bail or bond right, to or get waiting for a court date. Wow, that's a yeah. lot. That is that is uh, and and I mean you you sit there and you think, okay, let me get this straight. Uh, it's a it's a person that you know, and a lot of those as you as you might think are are uh, cannabis, yeah, right. cannabis possession specifically. Um, when you think about that, it's you you start to run down the mental thought pattern. One. So, so let me interrupt real quick just to yep. clarify the stat. Is that a is that a a, a regular seventy percent? Is that yep. normal over time, or it's because oh, I I guess what I was wanting to clarify because like right now with all the COVID stuff and all the different trying to figure out um, of how to move forward in life processes through the through the pandemic. Um, I wasn't sure if that's what kicked the numbers up or if that's just no, normal. That's, a, that's any given time. That's in the a last normal few, number. Last that's, several years. Yeah. That's pretty gross. I don't like that. Yeah. So, um, and, and that's we can talk about bail too. But, but I think that uh, for the for the war on drugs, um, this uh, we really have to end that because it's really the war. Uh, when you look at the numbers, it's really the war on poverty. Right. It uh, is. And um, so. I think that's why you'll see on our website we talk about cannabis legalization, not decriminalization. Full legalization. That's me too. I, I like I like I've, one of the guys on the show. He's been arguing for decriminalization for years. It's like no, if you get it, you got to pay your taxes on it. Like I got to pay my taxes on my 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 uh, my drug of choice, alcohol and caffeine. I pay my taxes on those. Your drug of choice, you got to pay taxes on it too. That's one of like. I'm not sure how much I want to have them special tax it either. Uh, I want to make. I'd be very concerned with because I my, my I have family in Colorado. Um, and they're right on that threshold where the black market still exists because yeah. it's still the the tax is starting to price it above black market, and that'd be a concern. Um, I'm sure that's something you would think about if that ever happens. So I mean, realistically, and I know Knox County a couple of years ago had it uh, had a, a, a I don't know exactly what the term was they used, but they had it on the bill to have legal pot in Knox County, even though it wouldn't have happened technically because the state would have to go legal to do it. But just as a hey we're down with this kind of thing. And then I guess it's also, um, I was talking to, I think it was Jesse Mayshark from the compass. He was telling me, it's like a lot of times lo local governments will do that, mm -hmm. assuming that it's coming down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so they can have all the structures in place so that when it does become legal in the state, um, that, um, we can actually have all the infrastructure in place for these businesses to start opening and the tax built and all that kind of stuff in it. So I guess the question is like, is that something realistic? Is that something that we, in Tennessee can expect to see in the next few years an actual um, legalized marijuana industry and in, in, in retail in the state? Absolutely. We're, I think the conversation now in, in next year's legislature will be more around how we do it, not should we do it. Right. Uh, you already see a lot of, uh, well, you see lots of Democrats and, and now lots of Republicans talking about it as well. Uh, and some of the uh, legalization bills are even coming from the Republican caucus. So, Well, because I've seen it, like I was looking at it, like I, I don't know how as any part of the government of any locality that you can't see the money Colorado and Oregon and Washington are, are, are raking in on their tax stuff. Because my sister's a teacher in Colorado. And, um, you know, through especially through this pandemic and stuff, like the, the, the funding that they had available to get students different things that they needed to work from home and all that kind of stuff was – was next level as far as that. And I don't know how anybody can, can look the other way. And especially when, you know, um, 
nobody's dying from i mean nobody's dying directly from it they're dying from the black market part of it they're not dying from the actual use of the drug um and so you know i i'm curious i'm excited to it um our we're in the hemp game um in in our business and so we got into it with projections of the the shift and hemp's done super well by itself Mm -hmm. so i'm not sure that we would take away from the hemp to replace it with THC rich, but I think we would um, add it as a secondary market in what we do, but it depends on how it's written um, on what we can do because one of the things about Colorado that I don't understand is that it's like this single line system where it's, um, as far as I understand it, at least it's grow and then grow sell only. You, there's no um, third party purchasing. And you can't have just a standard retailer of it. It's usually, it's got to be through a lot of different specific things. And then as long as the federal law is still there, it's cash only, which mm-hmm. gets, so that's a lot of cash moving around. So there's a lot of little parts that, you know, I mean, I understand that, you know, credit cards aren't going to play that game until it goes federally legal. Um, but, uh, I, I'm curious. I, I'm curious to know, and I guess we'll look forward to seeing more about that as it comes out, as, as all the details on how they go, because it is an industry that we are curious about, um, kind of transitioning into or in conjoin conjoining with as we move forward um, with our hemp uh, business and stuff like that. So, um, one of the big things I want to I want to uh, as we talk about taxes and things, one of the big things for me that I want to make sure we're doing is is especially when we're talking about medicinal uses mm-hmm. uh, that we are uh, we are not throwing a huge tax burden on the medicinal side. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of figuring out how we do that and, and how we make all these things happen in Tennessee. But um, but I think this could be a this could be a, a great thing for Tennessee. We've got the right climate. Right. Uh, we've uh, we've got all the structures in place uh, with the different companies like yours that are uh, that are doing hemp. Um, so I think it's a, it's a matter of figuring out the state legality, which I, I would say, I would say in the next two to four years we'll have done. Well, again, as, 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 as the libertarian in me says, just, it, it's a tomato, just treat it like tomatoes. Don't yeah. make it anything special. Don't do a subset tax bracket. Don't, I, I don't like the idea of syntax. I think it's, um, I mean, again, you talk about like war on poverty and stuff like that. Most of your syntaxes, um, hit the, hit the, the, um, What's the word I'm looking for? The least capable to pay the extra tax. Yep. I mean, you know, you get on the, I guess you get on the, some of the high end, you know, bourbons and stuff like that. Some of the higher echelon pays some of that extra alcohol tax. But, um, you know, I'm not a fan of the lottery. Um, I don't know if that's something that gets good. You get to talk about. They need to change the way they do it. I don't care that we have it. Um, I just don't like the way it's spent. I don't I really what grosses me out most is their ads. Like, I hate their ads. It just seems so like, hey, your life sucks throw some money at us and you might have a less sucky life at it. It's not, it's, it's not as direct at that, but that's how I, every time I see a, a, a Tennessee lottery ad, that's how I feel about it. It's like, it's a tax uh, on the poor. Yeah. That's and that's, yeah. And my dad's always said that it's a poor man's tax and, and it's, it's unfortunate. Um, but I, again, I don't see the, I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be there, but if we're going to do it, I think we need to do better with how we're doing it. I don't like that. It goes to secondary education. I think one of the big things for me personally is I think we need to graduate better high schoolers. Um, Instead of I got a statistic for you on that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 70% of, uh, of Tennessee high schoolers that go to community college require remediation. Yeah, that's gross. That's really gross. I mean, I just think it's, it's, you know, I mean, I have a very, my kids are both in the elementary school We're right here in Rocky Hill. Um, and Rocky Hill does very well. We have a very active PTO that pitches in a lot more than what the county and the, and all the taxes provide. Um, and I'm, I, I, I'm grateful for that. Um, but there's, you know, with the amount of money that the school board gets and the amount of, um, the amount of money that's out there, I just don't, I don't like how, like one of uh, Max who sits where you usually sit or where you're sitting, he usually sits there. His, uh, his whole thing is like, I don't care how much you tax me. Just quit sending home fundraisers. I'm tired of buying crap after school starts. It's like, get them in school, get them their whole set of new stuff. Okay. That's buying crap. And then a week later, you know, whatever activity that they're into or, you know, I mean, I get emails like once a week between the two teachers that I, my kids are with. It's like, Hey, we need this for the classroom. And it's like, we, we can't with a, with a $600 million budget, we can't have toilet paper or not toilet paper, but like it's always paper towels, you know, uh, wet wipes, stuff like that. So they're always asking for stuff. And it's like, we can't, you know, we can't afford all that. We can't afford these basic things. And then any activity on top of just the classroom is a pizza fundraiser or selling candy bars or something like that. 
um, that really, as I, as my kids are aging and they're getting into more stuff, it's really hard. Cause I hate asking people for, I, I, like my kids are in scouts and we sell popcorn and that popcorn is too expensive for what it is. And I understand it's a fundraiser, but you got to have some value for the product or people aren't going to pitch in. We get more people giving us a $5 bill to donate than they do buying the, the, the thing we're selling in, in scouts. And that, that's one of those things that drives us. So prison reform or is it is it about equal priority as far as between prison reform and criminal justice or is it you want to you're you you're pushing one more than the other or they're both kind of equal on your so i think i think our justice system's gotten to the point where we we need uh <clears throat> we need to overhaul the whole thing Okay. Uh, so, so all right, I'm going to stop you there. I know I was just fishing yeah. for some help for to move forward, but what does that mean overhaul? That's one of the yeah. things that gets me about a lot of the rhetoric in in politics is that you know we say we need to fix this, we need to change this, um, we need this, that, and the other to to happen, but it's always what we're trying to fix, not how we're fixing it. So when you say overhaul, tell me what you mean. Yeah, so uh, I mean ending cash bail. Okay. Uh, I mean that we shouldn't keep people locked up because they don't have the uh, ability to pay their bail. We need to. Uh, allow judges to use their brains and say, does this person need to remain incarcerated or can they be released on their own recognizance or through some other program? Uh, so that's that's a huge one. Um, the, the next one is ending time-based punishments. Right now, uh, if you uh, are convicted of a crime in Tennessee and in most states across the country, you're uh, sentenced to a time, uh, you know, quote-unquote time for the crime, uh, there's, there's no, there's no time that fits any crime. Uh, I kind of reject that as a notion. I get it. Right. Uh, what I, what I will <clears throat> accept is you to be given a treatment and transformation plan with goals built into it. Because I think that when we give people goals, we we're actually giving them something to do if they're incarcerated. Right. Instead of you're going to sit in this cage for three years and we expect when we release you you will have become a better person. Right. That's a ridiculous. Right. Uh, because, you know, one of the things I argue, um, I, I argue for a lot is I'm, I'm good with the premise of private prisons, prisons. I'm not good with the execution. My problem is, and this is, this is, this is your job. If this is something that comes up is, it is, it's, it's an incentives game. It's all it is. I, I, again, I, I'm a business person at heart. I, it's, it's all about the dollar bill for me, but when you, the government, are contracting with a private company for anything it's all about the incentive that's 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 the issue i have no problems with the idea of a private prison i think private prisons could run um more efficiently and more effectively <clears throat> than most public prisons in it, for the most part if they're incentivized correctly i think one of the big problems with the private prisons and everybody gets on them about it is they're incentivized wrong they're built to the the, the contract is built you get paid x number of dollars per person per month or per year or per whatever the time is. And so it's all about bodies in the building. And if that's what your incentive is, then you're going to do things to keep bodies in the building. You're going to go and, and, and lobby for can keeping the keeping uh, the, the drug war on so you can keep more people in there longer. Um, you're going to lobby for all these different things to to make more, get, keep, get and keep more people in jail. That's what the incentive, that's the problem with the incentive of the current private prison system. And I think that sucks. I think there's a way, um, and it would be a very interesting way if somebody could could tr- could try it at least once, is to to get the incentive program on a rehabilitation format instead of on a hold this person for a while thing. And whether part of that's being changing the the basis of how the punishment is set out in the first place, it's not a time; it's the things get set up in place. Because then, if I'm the the warden, for lack of a better word, and it's a get this guy in, get this guy out, but the longer he's out, the more you get paid. Then I'm in there with social workers, and I'm in there with um, um, uh, educators to get them capable of getting back out and getting a job and going back into the real world better instead of just keep them there as long as can. Oh, he picked his nose at the wrong time. That's an extra six months. That's that's the problem to me. So um, I, I went on a rampage there. I apologize, but that's one of those things to me. I get I get really defensive about the misuse of the word private business because I don't consider the private prisons, as we use that word a lot, truly a private industry. Um, because they get they their customer is the state and they're colluding with the state for what they want not working for their customer and i think that's part of the problem in there and i get really picky about that word private anyway i go that's so, that's uh, one of the hot buttons for me we see that we see that in so many uh in so many um private businesses that only do work with governments right, right? we see this collusion 
I mean, that's that's one of the big reasons that I'm against private prisons as they stand now. Uh, one of the things that I think, though, is, is you kind of touched on it there. Once we have judges sentencing people not to, hey, you're going to go spend three years, and therefore, because your sentence is three years, we can translate that into three years uh, worth of profit and, and so on and so forth. When they say, you're, I, we've worked in the court with this mental health provider, substance use counselor, education professional to develop this treatment and transformation plan with these goals built into it, uh, that, that gives someone some hope, which is a thing that we don't have a lot of in our justice system today. Um, but it, it also allows the, uh, the system to come around them and say, okay, how do we help you meet this? Right. Because we have a lot of these structures in place right. already, but they are, they're hard to get into. It's hard to get mental health care. Right. So far, uh, so far to date, my favorite interview we've done, and it was again, talking about our ignorance of what's going on is, um, the public defender, we had the two public defenders, Eric and, and Sharif, in here. Yep. Um, and that office, like, I feel bad for them because their interviews were not about them. It was about that office and how cool that office is and amazing that thing is. And so that's something that I've told everybody that's come through here, that whatever we need to do to help that office do more and better, I'm behind that. Um, and so, again, the, to, to, re, to, to restructure that thing. So um, to jump a little bit, um, what are your thoughts? I don't know how much you've been paying attention to it. I guess it's a little bit out of your thing, but... Um, we have this big fight going on currently about whether the uh, law director is going to stay in an elected office. And again, this is my ignorance is I didn't know what a law director was. Um, and honestly, shout out to Jesse Mayshark and the Compass, uh, the Compass Magazine because his article actually explained what the job is because um, I didn't know that part either. And so for the record, for everybody listening, the, the, the law director for Knox County is the attorney to... The council, uh, the, the county commission, as well as the attorney to the mayor's office, instead of other systems where it's appointed by the mayor and the council f- so they can select their own. So, you know, I get it on both sides. Like, why is, you know, it's weird to have it as uh, an elected position because their viewpoint on things might be completely different for the people they're working for, per se. Um, but at the same time, it kind of keeps a check in there between, you know, a, a, whatever the mayor is, Mayor Jacobs currently you know, bringing in his own guy that's going to really twist the law because that's how lawyers do, uh, twist the law to what the the office is asking. Um, so anyway, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know how much that applies. It may be ridiculous, but it's just something that's current conversation that I think is interesting. Yeah, so I, I think the discussion for me, it really comes down to, is this is the law director the people's lawyer or is he the mayor's lawyer? <clears throat> that's, that's really the uh, philosophical question. No, that's a good one. Uh, but I mean, I'll tell you where I stand on it. Uh, I I very much uh, I can't think of any time that I would that I would uh, say you know we need to take away the people's voice to decide who a government person should be. Um, that is that is what I keep coming back to. The more and more I think about it, uh, the law director we've seen uh, as Mayor Jacobs has tried to move, or I guess is succeeding in moving the uh, school board and other county offices out of the Andrew Johnson building into the TVA towers. Um, uh, if you call them towers or they're, they're more like, uh, I mean, for Knoxville, you know, I mean, we yeah. only got two real towers anyway, but yeah. Uh, but it but, sounds cool. But uh, you know, the law director pushed back on that and said this, this, I don't think this is right. Uh, and, and uh, right. Know, but did he look, was he pushing back to keep his job or was he pushing back because that is not how the charter is set up? Well, he's he wasn't on the ballot to be reelected, so uh, so he's not keeping his job, right? Okay. Uh, so I think I think one of the big things that I saw there is is you know uh, they are pretty politically aligned, the current law director and the mayor. But when it comes down to like questions of law and what is legal and what isn't, uh, I I think having the law director uh, with his own power instilled by the people. Uh, right is a place that we should stay uh, and i think that's not a bad idea I, I still don't know how i feel about it honestly because it's a, it, again one of the problems for me one of the problems that uh, presented itself into why we're doing the show is like until probably yesterday two days ago i didn't know who the law director was and had this been a year ago i wouldn't have looked into it because i didn't like this this whole part of this show is is me trying like i said at the beginning trying to understand the system and how the system works as well as who the people are trying to trying to fill the holes in the system and so you know it, it, a 
public defender is not a thing that most counties in the state of Tennessee are elective office for. I'm not sure after talking to the two of them whether it should or shouldn't be. I don't know. I, I like there. It's really cool. It was a very fan, fantastic interview. Um, you know, the DA is an elective office, and then we have this law director that sits in the middle. And it's like I don't, I, I, I don't understand the pieces that play well enough to feel like I have an informed decision, let alone what the job is. And so I'm getting better at all those parts and hopefully our listeners are too. And then again, that's the point. I don't hear us. I don't hear people asking the stupid questions when it gets to the media stuff. Everybody just assumes that everybody knows these different parts and pieces. I didn't know any of this. And so like yeah. right now I'm in a struggle cause I got to figure out who's running for law director. And cause I know that's on this ballot cause I've got my sample ballot right here. Cause I'm trying to keep yeah. up with everything. David Buke and Jackson Federer. Okay. And so I'll have to see what I can figure out about them. Um, I, it's just not, I'm not going to have time to get it out because it is part of this big general that's on this August 6th. Um, you know, and so, I don't know. Again, it's just something to talk about. And, um, one of the things we keep on and uh, one of the things that I'm big and hot on right now, um, and maybe we can close out on this one, is I'm pushing, I'm debating on whether or not I want to actually go through the process to push the ballot item of turning Knoxville Metro. I think I think it's inevitability. Everybody I've talked to about it so far agrees that it's going to happen, mm-hmm. but it's 10 to 15 years out. And... I feel like it's a waste of time. A um, couple of the people that I've talked to, you're a like, waste of money too. Right. That's my thing yeah. is it's a money thing. And so, uh, you know, um, who was it? Uh, Grant uh, Rosenberg district two off yep. the top of my head uh, was in here and he's like, Oh, it's not that much savings, but it's some savings. If we can cut out, you know, I don't want to unemploy. I don't want to cut people out of jobs, but if we can cut out 10, 15, 20 people that are making 35, 50, $65,000 a year from the government payroll, you know, that's, however much money that we can put back into schools or put it here, here or there. Um, so, so I have a, I have an interesting perspective on part of that Okay, go. and something that I want to get done at the state level. So uh, I'm all about government accountability and accountability directly to the people. Uh, one of the offices that is elected that is rarely accountable, and this is across the nation is uh, the sheriff, mm-hmm. uh, the local sheriff, uh, and and here's an interesting thing: the local sheriff in Tennessee isn't instilled with any um, real law enforcement powers. Those are instilled by the county. So if you take uh, if you take uh, David's County, right, the Nashville Metro government, mm-hmm. the sheriff is not who has the law enforcement powers for Davidson County. It is uh, the Metropolitan Police Department. The sheriff is only instilled with uh, uh, powers to to um I, I can't name them off the top of my head but uh serve papers and do more of this uh the clerical you, side of yeah like this constable type of thing gotcha. right? uh but it's the county that actually says okay it's the county commission that says we're going to give you uh the duties of law enforcement in our county so one of the big questions as as you go and pursue this idea of metro government um, one of the big questions is, are we going to keep the sheriff's department like it is with the with the power of law enforcement? One of the things that concerns me about that is when you instill law enforcement power in a county sheriff, you lose a lot of um, ability to hold that person accountable because the sheriff is an elected position uh, created by the state. Um, and it's not something that can be held accountable easy at the county level. Uh, and I think that that's a big reason why Metro Nashville went with this uh, sort of duo model, right? Uh, so that's one of the big things that that uh, I want to look at on the state level is how do we make county sheriffs not just accountable uh, every four years during the election, but but consistently accountable because right now no right something sh- that the commissions and stuff like that can actually yeah start a process instead of it having to be coming from the populace that makes exactly sense. Okay. yeah and because the county sheriff is under no uh, they don't have to hold public forum they don't have to hold public meetings they don't right. have to do any of these things right huh all right that's I mean that's I you know I don't the obviously I don't I don't know the details of how all the different departments work and where they would go because I would just assume that. I mean, my gut reaction would be that they, whether it's by title, whether we keep the police department title or the sheriff's office title, it would just be one office um, that covers all those bases as far as, you know, the corrections facility as well as, you know, the day-to-day beat cop in as well as serving papers and all the different other parts and pieces. But I don't, I don't I'm, you know, I don't know. Is there, I guess you're saying that the state requires a sheriff's office by, by county? Yes. So we would have to keep the sheriff's office at some level. Yep. Um, but it'd be whether or not we break them down to a very basic paper sh- paper shuffler i guess you know if that's i don't know that's a good that's a good question that's I, again I, I don't even know 
I think it's fine to have them in the same office if at the state level we can uh, apply more accountability on it to the people. Right. Um, not that just you show up at the ballot box every four years. Right. Uh, but, uh, but that you um, you have to hold public meetings. You have to let the people tell you how they're feeling. You have to be accountable to your uh, county commission, that sort of thing. All right, I lied. I want to close off with another question. So we, we talked a lot about the prison side of things. Um, we talked about the Green New Deal a little bit. We talked about getting rid of uh, the war on drugs, trying to legalize pot in the state of Tennessee, stuff like that. Um, and so I guess it kind of all revolves around the same thing anyway. But as far as um, the policing, do you, I mean, how do... You know, it's it's a very big national topic right now. Mm-hmm. I haven't personally seen a lot going on in Knoxville that um, you know, maybe I'm fortunate to be out of some of that stuff, but um, I don't see a lot of issues. I mean, you know, for, for I don't know, maybe it's just me being knee-deep in media and trying to do better to understand what's going on. Is that We had that guy from Florida get shot on the interstate a couple weeks ago, mm-hmm. and I was like, I, I, like that, to me, that my gut reaction with seeing all the other news going on, I was like, uh-oh. We're going to have some some serious stuff going on here in Knoxville from that. Um, turns out, at least if the media story is true, this guy sh- uh, just killed somebody in Florida and was running. Um, and I guess you know wasn't wasn't really keen on stopping for the Knoxville Police Department either. And and it had to end that way. Um, don't like that. I don't ever like him ending that way. I prefer you go to jail and and we uh, at least get some form of you know the process doing what the process does. That's one of the things most disturbing to me about any time a police officer kills somebody is that that we have undercut the process that made that police officer judge jury and executioner in, mm-hmm. the, in one fail swoop and that's that's a problem to me and so we had eddie Madison, and he was and in his mayoral run at least he was very very vocal about trying to get a community a community policing program in place um which on the surface level i think is the right move i haven't dug into it deep um I mean, your thoughts on as far as um how things sit currently as well as how we can do better in the future yeah, so this is a this is a topic we could dig in in a whole <laughs> podcast for sure. But uh, the abridged version. Yeah, the abridged version. So outside of the political campaign, I'm actually working with some other groups, uh, meeting with Chief Thomas of KPD um, because I've worked in 911 dispatch uh, when uh, during my time as an EMT as well. I really think that when you look at the some of the issues we have here in Knoxville, a lot of them are around mental health and substance use. And the police have said, we don't want to be responsible for that. Right. We're not substance use counselors. We're not mental health providers. And that's how I look at it is, is we've, we've used policing as the Swiss army knife of government. And that's unfair to the public. That's unfair to police officers. Uh, so the conversations we've been having with chief Thomas and some of, um, some of her other chiefs is that, we want to divert these calls at the 911 call. We want mental health providers to be out in the field uh, in a in a true mobile fashion. So when you call 911 and you explain, and this has to do a lot with with um, with really uh, ramping up what we do at the 911 center. Um, but when you call 911 and explain the, that there's someone having a mental health issue or substance use issue, it's you know whatever it is. The first thing you're going to get is a mental health team, substance use team out there. Uh, and we've been discussing different things about about KPD responding, but sitting around the block and waiting until they're called in by the uh, right. counselors and different things like so that. So the KPD's main part is to contain that person to a confined space so that they're, whatever's going on doesn't get into other people's business. Yeah, and so, then letting the letting a professional I uh, see and and like on the surface I'm like okay, makes total sense. But then the 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 business part of my brain goes that's money. That's that's a lot of money. Um and, and how how to how to properly uh, uh fund a department that does all these extra things if we're trying to subset it is is that's where my gut reaction goes. So um let me let me put it to you this way uh about the money thing. So I think one of the key things is is that is that, and Chief Thomas has said this to me several times: is that the uniform is a point of escalation in a lot of, a lot of situations. Right, that's something we've talked about a ton, and it's like, at what point was it like eleven or twelve years old? Did you go? That's not my friend anymore. When you yeah. see a police officer, like I don't know when that I don't know when that age is, but there is some point, middle school, high school age, where it's just like there is a there is a switch that you are 
pounded into your head when you're in elementary school that cops are your friends, police are your friends, we want to be friends, they're here for you, blah, 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 blah. But at some point, that flip switch is hard. Yeah. And then it's whatever I can do so that they don't even see me and know I exist. Yep. Um, and that's a problem in and of itself, and I don't know how to fix that one. Anyway, I interrupted. Uh, so, so yeah, when when we look at the when we look at the cost of it, right? Uh, so, uh, the Knox County Sheriff's Department just had a lawsuit issued against them for wrongful death, uh, and I think that that case happened a year ago. Uh, the average payout for these things is is like three four million dollars. Right. So even if this mental health team and mental health and uh, mental health people back me up on this they're not paid very much uh and maybe that's something we should change but yeah, but, but we'll, the the idea is if we if we uh forgo even one wrongful death lawsuit that's gonna pay a couple of years have, of some we will have right. paid for that department for a couple of years all right so again devil's advocate on this one because this is where my brain goes is what happens when one of those social workers gets killed by an individual and that same lawsuit happens against Knox County Police Department or Knox County Sheriff's Office or the KPD for this example. Um, we have that same kind of, you know, I, I, again, you don't have to answer that one. It's just this is... I the, have an answer for that one. Okay, actually, but this so. is how my brain works. Is that, like I feel like, you know, we're going to put some people that are, that may not be prepared for that part of things in some situations. Um, and, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, that that's that's a scary idea to me that somebody that's not ready for it gets, gets stuck in a, in a deadly situation. Um, but anyway, your answer to that. Uh, so there... Today, we're putting social workers and mental health providers, substance use counselors, in these dangerous situations all the time. They're, they're in mobile crisis. They're in facilities where you have a lot of these people in confined spaces. Um, so I think uh, it's, uh, it's really important to remember these people are already trained for this. This is their full-time job. Uh, it's police that aren't trained to handle a lot of these situations right now. So, um, and I think the other core thing is that we also should not put this under the, under the banner of policing. These people shouldn't work for the police department. Um, because when we, uh, again, the, the uniform, uh, even the structure of who's paying who is a point of escalation when you know that, Oh, these, these social workers work for the police department, uh, just having right. that budget in another place, I think, I think right. moves them closer to the community. Yeah, because yeah, because you know, I mean, because you see it sometimes here and there, um, where you have uh, fire and ambulatory services that are kind of getting flack from citizenry because they're associated with. Yep. I see what you're saying. Um, was that? Yeah, wasn't that the premise of American History X? Isn't that? Do you remember that movie at all? No, you're not old enough. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. Um, you know, we could, like you said, we could go on for hours on some of these specific issues because I find them highly important as well as fascinating as far as, you know, a lot of the bigger issues, um, there's no one approach, you know, and I think a lot of people get stuck in their version of the one approach and they're unable to kind of flex to say, okay, well, that, you know, that's not my idea, but it could work. Um, and that's something that, you know, again, I, I, I identify hard as a libertarian and then um, any way that we can... We, we, reduce the government influence on certain things is my general stance but i'm also a realist i don't pretend to think that we could go on some full anarchist libertarian um society and, and really function well long term so um you know I, I i'm open to the ideas and i'm i'm very interested in some of these i think um you know some of the green new deal stuff is okay i like you know it's the balance of spending is always the issue to me it's always like i don't i mean you know we we are particularly fortunate um for me specifically, because I'm in county, I'm not in the city by six feet. Um, you know, I pay. You know, I, I my my taxes are reasonable. Um, I was talking to a friend from from North Carolina. He has a he has his standard federal income tax. He has a five percent state income tax and a five percent sales tax. So it's a little bit ahead of us on the on the whole if he spends all his money in one year. And so trying to trying to figure out how to balance all these things and get these services to the people that need them. Um, but also, I'm not making it so painfully expensive to live here that everybody runs away. Because that's the thing to me is that like I always kind of put it as you know run your state like a business your your um, your income is your taxes and you want to get it as high as you can but at the same time your customer is your constituent and you've got to get them and, and you've got to they've got to feel value for what they're paying in their taxes and as long as you feel value as long as I feel value in what I'm paying in my taxes I'm not going to pitch too much of a fit. Um, which again, that's why the Metro thing's a big deal for me. So, um, Matthew Park, everybody, I really appreciate him coming in today. I want you to give your, uh, contact any way people want to get in touch with you. Um, any places people can find more information on you. 
Um, and remember everybody, August 6th, that is Thursday. Um, I'm going to have this packed up and out tonight. So you've got a couple days to make up your minds, people, and get out there and vote. Um, if you're not registered, or you're probably too late. So um, get out and vote, everybody. Um, Matthew Park, please close us out with your information. Yeah, absolutely. So you can check uh, all of my policies and platform out on our website, matthewpark.com. Uh, of course, we're on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Uh, so you can check us out there as well and see what we're up to on the daily. Uh, feel free to send me an email. It's matthew at matthewpark.com uh, and, uh, or reach out to us on any of the social media uh, things. And we'd be happy to uh, discuss any policy platform with anybody. So I think uh, it's important to know that when we, uh, when we win the election, it's, uh, you're representing the whole district and, and really the whole state. So that's what, that's what I'm going to carry to Nashville. And uh, I'm uh, thankful for you having me on here today. Cool. All right, everybody, like I said, that is Matthew Park of MatthewPark.com. Um, I'll have the links in the show notes. Um, and like I said, I've got three more coming up later today. Um, we're going to stay busy. We're going to get as much information on as we can. And again, August 6th, it is a Thursday, which is weird. We're so used to these Tuesday elections on everything else. But this is a Thursday. It's always a Thursday. Um, so get out. Go vote. Be informed. If you want to get in touch with us, it's almost an agreement at gmail.com. You can hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, we are on YouTube uh, and most of your podcast providers as well. Um, I'll have this packed up and out as soon as I can. And we appreciate y'all. We'll be back in a couple hours with some more.